Bibles, if you would, to Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. I'll also be using Matthew chapter 28 uh, this morning, but we'll start off with Matthew chapter 27. I'd like to speak to you on the dusk of darkness and the dawn of destiny. You know, for those of us who are Christians, for those of us who love the Lord, for those of us who are called according to His purpose, today is a day of rejoicing, a day of happiness, a day of peace. Because what the adversary intended to be, the dusk of darkness, God completely turned on him into the dawn of destiny. So this morning I want to take you on a little trip. I want us to all load up in the airplane. We're going to fly over to the Middle East. We're going to take a look at a destination. We're going to take a look at some of the things that transpired there. And I believe we're also going to be able to see the things that we have in our future that are waiting for us there. The dusk of darkness, the dawn of destiny. Matthew chapter 27, reading verses 27 through 31. When the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, they stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they took the reed, and they struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Loved ones, when we think about history... History is a collection. We have a college professor in our congregation, so I'm probably going to get in trouble now. I'm sure he'll grade me. You know? But let me say that history represents periods. And those periods are assembled and they're assimilated and they're accounted for. Days turn into weeks. Weeks eventually turn into years. Years turn into decades. And Decades form centuries, and on and on it goes. And you know, the passage of time in and of itself can seem mundane. Sometimes it can really seem boring. But you know, there are moments in history that are meaningful. There are moments in history that require our attention. There are moments in history that shape the landscape of our future that actually form the foundation of our life. Now, just in the time I've been alive, I've been blessed to know many memorable moments in history. But I want you to know this morning, our text is the most momentous moment of history that there ever has been and that there ever will be. There's nothing else in the annals of history that will ever compare to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In America's history, there was a day that Franklin Roosevelt stood on December 7, 1941, after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, and he said, this is a day that will live in infamy. I remember September 11th when our nation was shaken to the core and President George Bush stood above the rubble all around the Twin Towers and he said, I can hear you, the world hears you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear from all of us soon. I remember that day. Some of us also remember November 9th, 1989. That's the day the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, and I can just hear President Ronald Reagan talking to the Tsar of Russia and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. 
I remember that day. Do you remember where you were when the space shuttle Challenger exploded? I remember where I was. I was in a motel room in Oklahoma City. I, I remember the exact moment. And when that happened, our president addressed the nation. And he said, they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Now these are memorable events in history. They're marked events that changed our life, that changed our destiny, that changed our nation. But I want you to hear me this morning. There are two days recorded in God's Word that forever have altered the course of of humanity. One of them is a day of darkness, but the other is a day of destiny. The crucifixion was truly a day of infamy. It was infamous because of sin. You see, the depravity of mankind was put on full display at the cross of Calvary. It was infamous for sin, but it was also infamous for separation. Because the separated Savior was separated from the Father in glory on our behalf. John 1, chapter 11 says, He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. Jesus said in Mark chapter 6 and verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Now I'm going to pause here just a minute because I want to apply that to me. I can tell you right now with complete certainty that I never really understood that passage of Scripture until God called me in the ministry. When God called me in the ministry... It's like everything changed with my family and my loved ones. You know what? They don't understand me anymore. They love me. They put up with me. But they don't understand why. Why do you spend endless hours? Why do you work 18-hour days and, and more? Why are you sitting in hospitals? Why are you called out at all hours? We, that's time away from us. Now listen, I was raised as a preacher's son, and I felt exactly the same way about my daddy. I always wondered, why does daddy have to do this? Why isn't daddy around? I tell you what, I understand more than ever what this passage of Scripture and what Jesus said in Mark chapter 6 and verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own relatives. They don't understand. They don't understand why we spend more of our money on other people than we do on ourselves. That, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard from my own family, don't you know they're just using you? You know, they're just taking advantage of you. And my response is, they may be. But you know what? That's their problem. It's not my problem. If the Lord prompts me to give to you, I'm going to give to you. What you do with it is up to you. You're going to have to be accountable for it. Jesus said, freely he gives and freely I need to give. It was infamous for sin that day of crucifixion. It was infamous for separation. But it was also infamous because of the significance of that day. I want you to stop and think about that day. That's the day when the creation killed the Creator. Have you ever thought about that? The creation rose up. The creation seized the Creator. And they killed the Creator. They thought. They desired. They wanted to. That day, the world experienced the dusk of darkness. But praise God, there's another day. Amen? There's a spectacular day. There's a day of direction and divinity, a day of dedication, a day of declaration. He has risen. And that's the dawn of destiny. 
It affects my destiny and your destiny and your mother's and your father's destiny and your children's destiny and your friend's destiny. It affects the destiny of society forever, forever life and death were changed. It shook the foundations of doubt, the foundations of disbelief. So today, on our virtual trip, I want to take us to Golgotha. I want us to experience the landscape. I want us to to look at the garden tomb. And may we never, ever, ever forget the dusk of darkness and the dawn of destiny. Let's spend time with Jesus. The night before his execution when he said in John chapter 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You know, I struggled with the title to this message because sometimes it's, as pastors, we tend to get a little cute. You know, we try to be cute in what we do. I even, I, I had Kathleen on the phone one day when I was working on this message, and I, I gave her three, I said, I'm struggling for the title to this message, and I gave her my three options. And she came back with that wisdom and said, I like all of those, Pastor. No! You got to pick! But one of those titles, that I had was based on John chapter 14 and verse 6. I thought about calling the title to the message, The Death of Life. Because in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the life. And today we have to deal with the death of life. And also the resurrection of life. It's a glorious day. Jesus is the creator of all life. Thank God he's the sustainer of all life. Thank God he's the provider of eternal life. So on our trip, our first stop as we're flying over, let's look at the destination of his demise. Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 and 33. And they went out. They found a man of serene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. And when he tasted it, he would not drink it, and when they had crucified him, they divided his garments. Loved ones, the destination of demise for Jesus was a rocky mountain ridge. It was known as Golgotha. The Latin name for this particular mountain ridge is Calvaria. Now, I think sometimes we don't really have an understanding of when we say Calvary. You know, what exactly are we talking about? When we say Calvary, we're using that root word Calvaria, which actually means the top of the skull. The very top of the skull is the Calvaria, and we have morphed that into the English word Calvary. So when we say, years I spent in vanity and pride at Calvary, we're saying on top of the skull. Because that's exactly what Golgotha looked like. It was a rocky mountain ridge with dead bodies that were left to rot. It was covered with skulls of the people who had been crucified who had been tortured there it smelled like blood it smelled like feces it smelled like urine it was a shameful place it was a sinister place in our history but Golgotha is very important it's important to the Jewish customs Jesus knew all about Calvaria the temple listen to this 
Did you know the Jewish temple was first built on the Golgotha mountain ridge? Now think about that. The temple was built on the exact same ridge as later the Savior of the world would give himself as a living sacrifice for sin. So Golgotha is famous. It was famous for that temple that was built. But centuries before, listen to this. Do you remember the story when Abraham was supposed to take his son Isaac? And God had told him to take him to a mountain ridge that God would lead him to? And there on that mountain ridge, he was supposed to take the knife and kill his son as a sacrifice to God, guess where that took place? It took place on the rocky ridge of Golgotha. Wow. History repeats itself. Genesis chapter 22 tells that story. After these things, God tested Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. I think I'd say more than that if God talked to me. When I heard his voice, "Mm -hmm," he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. How absolutely astounding that history repeats itself. On the same mountain, with the same purpose, but this time, It involves the sinless Son of God. His destination was in the dusk of darkness, and the dusk of darkness was on Golgotha. So on our trip this morning, we visit the destination of his demise at Golgotha, but our second stop, I want us to see the degradation of his death. Look at Matthew 27, verses 36 through 44. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their head and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you're the Son of God. Why don't you come down off that cross? So also the chief priest with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now verse 35 tells us that when Jesus reached his destination, which was the place of the skull, Calvaria, Golgotha, He suffered death, but it wasn't enough that he suffered death. He suffered death with degradation. Verse 35, and when they had crucified him. Crucifixion is the most hideous, the most cruel, the most torturous, the most tumultuous death that anyone could ever have imagined. Listen, the condemned that was crucified suffered death maximum shame and maximum embarrassment. They stripped Jesus naked to hang him on the cross. They drove the nails through the tendons of the wrist, through the arch of the feet. Death came by asphyxiation. Cramps would make the body writhe and wriggle to the enjoyment of the crowd. They looked and enjoyed his suffering. Your arms would fatigue. You'd struggle to get a breath. You could get air in, but you couldn't get air out. 
Carbon dioxide builds up in your bloodstream. Hours of limitless pain. Slowly your chest begins to fill with fluid until it compresses your heart. And your heart can no longer beat. Jesus suffered a degrading death on Golgotha. And listen to me. It was all for me. And it was all for you. Amen. I don't like having to paint that picture. It hurts me to paint that picture. But let me tell you, loved ones, may we never ever forget the gruesome death, the gruesome degradation of our Savior at the cross of Calvary. But now, I want you to pay special attention to something. We're going to find it in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Three hours of absolute darkness. Do we understand exactly what that darkness represents? At the sixth hour, something took place. Something majestic took place. Something profound. Something supernal. Something supernatural. Something absolutely stupendous took place at the sixth hour. And I'm afraid we overlook it. I think we just, we passed over that in that story. And we just think, oh well, God was mad. So to show he was mad, he made it all dark. Or, or whatever things our minds come up with. But listen, Lord, God's Word never gives us anything that He doesn't intend for us to pay attention to. And God's Word never gives us anything that doesn't have absolute meaning in our life. It's not just an oh well. It's not just a oh God felt like this today. He has a purpose. He has a purpose for everything that He does. I want us to pay attention this was a crucial part of God's plan when at the sixth hour, darkness covered the entire land. Don't miss this application. It's God's miraculous power. You see, my Bible tells me that sin is black. My Bible tells me that sin is dark. My Bible tells me that men don't like the light and they like the darkness because their deeds are evil continually. That's what my Bible tells me. And in every part of God's Word that I visit, it tells me that sin is dark and sin is black. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So I want you to see this on our trip this morning. About the sixth hour, Jesus is hanging on the cross. And the miraculous, stupendous, most wonderful thing took place. The most wonderful thing in your life, the most wonderful thing in my life, took place about the sixth hour when darkness covered the entire earth. Because the darkness of man's sin was completely transferred to Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you see it? Do you understand the darkness? The entire sin, the dark black sin of the entire world at the sixth hour 
is transferred onto Jesus as he hung on the cross of Calvary. And it was dark from the sixth hour through the ninth hour. Jesus became me at that moment on the cross. Because you see, I should have been forsaken, not Him. I deserve the shame, not Him. Those nails were for me, they weren't for Him. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of his love. But praise God. He loves me anyway. He took the shame. There was a great old singer. I know Brother George will know the name. I don't know how many other here will of Dallas Home. He wrote a song and it said, I was guilty with nothing to say. And they were coming to take me away when a voice from heaven was heard that said, let him go. Take me instead. And he said, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. It's resurrection morning, y'all. Amen? Have we ever stopped to think about one word, just one word from Jesus, and all those soldiers would have vaporized. Just one of his thoughts, and the nails in his hands and his feet would have melted away. The Bible says just one prayer from Jesus and a legion of over 10,000 angels would have showed up to help him with just a nod of my Jesus' head. He could have taken away the pain and the degradation and the suffering. But his dedication to duty made a resounding declaration, and that declaration continues to resound. Today, it will resound forever through the annals of creativity and eternity. Jesus said, I love you. And how did he say, I love you? Luke chapter 23, verse 34 records it. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. What a declaration. We're forgiven. And I want you to know no matter what we've done, when we did it, where we did it, why we did it, who we did it with, Jesus promised us in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sin no more. And Jesus did all of this in the dusk of darkness. He forgave us. He fulfilled us. He finished His course. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The blood of Jesus became my bond on Calvary. So on our trip, we've seen the destination of his demise. We've seen the degradation of his death. We hear the declaration of his dedication. But all of that would be meaningless without the last point. On our little journey, I want us to see the deity of his deliverance. Matthew chapter 27 
And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Hallelujah to the living Lamb of God. Now, do you think those that were present might have taken notice of those things? You think... You think it might have kind of got their attention? I mean, after all, there's darkness in in the middle of the daytime. There's an earthquake. There's solid rocks that are splitting and falling all around them. The temple is shaking. The veil to the tabernacle was ripped and torn. The Bible says the soldiers were dazed. They were confused. And all of a sudden, in that moment, doubt and disbelief were instantly transformed into faith and hope. Preacher, how do you know that? I'll tell you how I know it. Verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, and they saw what took place, they were filled with awe, and they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah to the living Lamb of God. Thank you for His love and His grace and His goodness. Thank you for His death with degradation at the cross of Calvary. And thank you for the deity of His deliverance. Hallelujah. Listen, loved ones, because of the deity of Jesus, we're loosed. We're liberated. We're loved. John chapter 8 says, if the Son sets you free, (laughs) I'm free indeed. I'm free. There was a little girl with a, a blood disease. And death was imminent. And the only way that she could be treated was she needed a complete transfusion of blood. But it couldn't just be any old blood. It couldn't be blood they had in the blood bank, necessarily. This little girl had to have a transfusion of blood to live, and it had to come from somebody else who had had the same disease and who had been healed of that disease because their blood contained the enzymes that were necessary to heal her. Now, as it happens, her little brother had had the same disease and had been healed and miraculously cured of the disease. The doctor talked to the parents and they said, would you consider letting Johnny give the transfusion to his sister. And the parents said, that's up to our our little boy. We'll let him choose. So the doctor set little Johnny down and he explained the situation. He told him about his sister, that his sister was going to die if she didn't get a blood transfusion. And the doctor tried to explain to the little boy that the importance of his blood and that his blood contained the enzymes that were necessary for his sister to live. When he got through explaining everything, he, he asked little Johnny, he said, well, what do you think? Are you willing to do that for your sister? Johnny sat silently, and then his lips began to shake. Finally, he looked at the doctor and he said, it's my sister. I'll do it. So they took them into the transfusion room. They laid his sister on one table. They laid the little boy on the other table. They inserted the needles. The blood and the transfusion began to flow. That's a slow process. They had to lay there for quite some time. Finally, the doctor came in to check on the boy and the girl. 
And he went over to the little boy and he said, Johnny, how are you? Johnny looked up at the doctor and said, So doctor, when do I die? That's when it dawned on the doctor. The trembling in that little boy's lips when he was asked. The hesitation to answer. Because the little boy thought, I have to give my life for my sister. And he was willing. Wow. You know what, what touches me the most about that story? Is that's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. My Bible tells me we have a sin disease. And only the blood of the one who has conquered the sin disease can be my transfusion. Only the blood of the sinless Lamb of God will save me. Only His precious blood will deliver me. And I'm so thankful that Jesus never hesitated to give His blood for me. And as His precious blood ran down that cross, He infused my eternity. He forever infused and healed my infirmity. Ephesians chapter 1 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood. Only deity could deliver what the Son of God brought to you and me at the cross of Calvary. So the verdict was rendered. The case is closed. The price of sin is paid. The enemies are scattered. The trial is all over. But wait, wait. It gets better. <laughs> we're nowhere near the end of our journey. We're not at, we're not at the end of our trip. It's kind of like that TV commercial for Ginsu knives, you know? They slice, they dice, and then at the end they say, it, but there's so much more. I thought about, now this, this I know the guys will identify with. I don't know if you ladies will or not. But on college football game day, they have a coach named Lee Corso. Coach Corso is known for one statement and one statement only. Not so fast, my friend. That's what he always says. Not so fast, my friend. Well, let me tell you this morning. It ain't over yet. Not so fast, my friend. Let's hop on our virtual airplane and let's fly to the garden tomb. Let, let's go down there. We find it in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus. He is not here. He is not here. He is risen. And I want you to know this morning, He's still risen. And He will always be risen. And His precious blood and the atonement of my sin was made efficient through His redemption and resurrection from the dead. Wow, He's alive. He's alive. Jesus paid my sin debt in the dusk of darkness, but then He confirmed my life in the dawn of destiny. Hallelujah to the living Lamb. 
Because he rose, I'm going to rise. Because his tomb is empty, my spiritual tomb is empty. Because he lives, I live. Because he loves, I love. Because he lifts, I am lifted up. Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote that song that the worship team sang this morning. So appropriate for today's service. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. Life is worth the living. Just because he lives. Only a mighty God can turn the dusk of dark into the dawn of destiny. I want you to pay attention to the last line in a song that was written in 1933 by A.H. Ackley. We touched on this song too. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. Now pay attention, this is the most important part. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That's where he lives. And I want you to know this morning... That if you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to have to be in your heart. Your words don't mean nothing. Your dirty actions don't mean nothing. Only what's in your heart. And that has to be the sinless Son of God. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. How does he he get into my heart? Here it is. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, where? Your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, with the what? The heart. One believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So what a trip, huh? What a journey. We visited Jesus. We saw Golgotha. We viewed the crucifixion. We experienced the power of God. We've seen the empty tomb. We've felt the Savior's love through His death and His burial and His resurrection. And I hope, I pray, that you've enjoyed your trip. Because you see, our journey has taken us through the dusk of darkness into the dawn of destiny. But now we're making our final approach. I always love it when the pilot says that. Couldn't he use better language? I don't want it to be a final approach. I want to make more of them, amen? But he always says, now we're making our final approach. So in preparation for our landing this morning, I need all of your seat backs in their full upright and locked position. Your tray tables stowed. Your seat belt needs to be securely fashioned because we're going to land this message right now. In preparation for our landing, I want to ask you the most important question that you'll ever answer. Do you believe in your heart? Do you believe in Jesus Christ in your heart? Do you believe that He raised you from the dead? That He is your salvation? That He is the raiser? He's going to raise us. He's the one who's going to do the raising. Amen? Because 
He is risen. Do your actions on a daily basis prove that He's in your heart? I tell you, we have such wonderful people in our church. And I can tell you that most of you never even really know how wonderful they are. Because they're up here when you don't see them. Working. Doing. Don't have to beg them and cajole them. Don't have to point out a need. They see it, they meet it. They take care of it. You know, I can look at them and know Jesus is in their heart because of what they do, not what they say. Amen? Are your friends looking at you? Is your family looking at you? Are your co-workers looking at you? Are they able to say, Jesus is in their heart? I can tell it by the way they act. I can tell it by the things they do. It's not what we say. It's what we do. I've got really good news this morning. This is a great message. It's a message of hope. It's a message of love. It's a message of deliverance. It's good news because... This message lets me know today can be the dawn of my destiny. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Stand with me. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank You for this day. Thank You for Resurrection Day. The day when my life changed. Father, I don't even have the words to thank You for Your love. It's always there. Always abiding always growing. Father, I ask You this morning in Jesus' name that if there's one person who doesn't know You, who You do not live in their heart, Father, would You draw them to You this morning? Would You touch them in such a significant way that they'll never, ever, ever be the same. And Father, we'll give You the honor. We'll give You all the glory. And I ask it in the precious name of my Son.